the dawn of this day, I had slain Baycock. This fight was sponsored by Vane Minor, several agricultural farms, and 3000 dirt. And as I returned victorious to my basic base, I received visions for what I must do next. Here, was the plan that I had formulated. Since I had obtained the bow of Baycock, I had unlocked two new paths to choose from. I could either begin an illegal vegetable farm starting with the root of the fallen one. Or I could begin a disastrous industrial revolution starting with bloodied stone. And I choose, the second option. This shall entail the creation of preposterous amounts of steel, to build several brutalist contraptions, invent electricity to power my micro-society, and use technology that should not have been given to me. And the ultimate goal, is to become powerful enough to face off the next bosses in the way of unlocking the bag of truth. But of course, none of this would be easy. Part 1 of Step 1 of Phase 1 of the plan begins with exploitation of the so-called laws of physics in this game. It was time to mine thousands of iron ore and thousands of coal. And I already had a plan to speed run mining. You may recall the infinite stone vein mining incident of April 2023. I could use stone pickaxes to excavate infinite stone to acquire infinite stone pickaxes, enabling me to rapidly dig endless caves throughout the whole world, essentially turning me into the eater of worlds from Terraria reference. But I had improved the strategy for today's infinite iron mining purposes. This time, I brought my bed and a container of lava. Whenever I ran out of hunger from mining 5 quadrillion objects, I would set my spawn point in this tunnel, before immolating myself, resulting in me respawning here with full hunger again. Death had no consequences, because everything I had on me would be safely stored in this grave, so it was as if nothing had ever happened. Now I could truly mine in Minecraft forever, as long as I had enough wood to keep making stone pickaxes. And as for the mental consequences of doing this, it was bearable because this strategy was basically scratching lottery tickets to possibly find ores within the earth. And it was getting addicting. So I had no problem doing this for the rest of eternity. The main issue now was storing all of the ores that I burglarized. And the solution, was the epic backpack. Which was basically what it was called. This was simply just a few diamonds, alumite, and leather clobbered together. It was so epic, that its real holy name was hidden from us. And zombies tried ambushing me during this epic moment. So I executed them promptly. Also I got rewarded 30 golden ores. However, after approximately 300 stone pickaxes, I realized that I had statistically unusually low amounts of iron ores, corresponding to 5 standard deviations below the mean amount of iron ores obtained by the average gamer. And it was because the iron ores blended in perfectly with the granite stone, which made it look like granite stone. So I decided to create a texture pack to make the iron ore obvious. First, I cracked open the underground biome modification and extracted all of the textures, which I moved to my texture pack. I then searched for the vanilla Minecraft iron ore overlay. I opened this in Paint 3D and drew an obvious red circle over it. This would make it so that all iron ores would have a red circle exposing them. And it worked magnificently. These iron ores thought they were safe from me by disguising themselves as granite. But they were now exposed to my visual perceptions. I could now locate iron ores from hundreds of blocks away. And to make this moment even more victorious, I just drowned a baby skeleton in lava. But do not let the media trip you. Because in reality, I was not obtaining many ores from this strategy of strip vein mining the entire world. I was averaging 8.7 ores per minute. And a few golden nuggets, because they started appearing out of nowhere for some reason. If anyone else sees this, please confirm that this is not a hallucination, by liking and subscribing and commenting. But when all of 5% of all hope was about to be lost, I looked at the top right corner of my screen and I saw what appeared to be lava. This small visual detail was overpowered, because this minimap was basically an x-ray for caves. And caves had massive amounts of ores. So this minimap was basically an x-ray for ores. I proceeded to rapidly vein mine and destroy and die and respawn my way towards the orange bubble on my minimap. After sacrificing what must have been my 200th stone pickaxe, 
I discovered a massive cave system. And inside this cave system, were several tens of red circles showing where the iron ores were. So it was time to deplete this cave of natural biodiversity and neurological constructs, before leaving to vein mine and destroy and die and respawn towards the next cave system. All opposition was steamrolled using just lava. But then, I ran into a problem that couldn't be solved with lava. This problem, was a dungeon infested with invisible shadows. But their existence, led to the downfall of their existence, because their health bars exposed them. So they weren't so invisible after all, and were disposed of quite easily using this emergency diamond sword. Eventually, I reached my vague milestone of obtaining a few hundred iron ores. So I switched from personality 5 to personality 6, which focused on mining copper and coal, which would be equally important for the upcoming industrial revolution. To be exact, I would need a few hundred copper and at least a thousand coal, in order to never have to mine again for the next few days. So after doing a little bit of mining in this seemingly endless cave system sponsored by Young's Better Caves, I was now finished with mining. And my backpack was stuffed with several technology critical elements ranging from silver to lead to osmium to even more coal. Now it was time to double it all into ingots, using the smeltery. Too bad it was too minuscule to handle this sudden wave of ores. So it was time to create the advanced smeltery V2MK3 generation 4. Here's how. I could melt my infinite supply of cobblestone into molten but seared bricks. Casting these would create free infinite real seared bricks. These could be assembled into seared bricks, which could be used to vertically expand the smeltery, which would increase the maximum amount of substances I could destroy at the same time. However, horizontal expansion was also possible. Therefore, it happened. This 5x5 five five smeltery now had 5 faucets all simultaneously and automatically casting objects feeding into this chest. The final improvement I did, was to make an input system because I was too lazy to shift click something every 30 seconds. Now, all I had to do was shift click something every 10 minutes. And that something, was osmium as well as nickel and iron. But when molten nickel and iron touch, they give birth to inver. And all of these, were being cast into multitudinous ingots. With this, I was now ready, to get into the first technological age. Which was based on immersive engineering. A truly immersive modification that I had trolled previously on this propaganda outlet. A modification where I must create massive machines and feed them energy and raw materials to produce some not raw materials. But the final roadblock preventing me from achieving my first machine, was myself. Here is an explanation of what I just said. The first two machines to kickstart the industrial revolution were the coke oven and blast furnace. Both of these needed osmium, inver, and bloodied stone. And bloodied stone needed blood and blood can be obtained, by smelting myself. So it was time, for an act of heroic self-sacrifice. I ascended to the edge of my seared altar, before casting myself into the lake of molten osmium and inver. This gave about 200 milliliters of blood, which is approximately 1.25 blood meatballs. So according to my calculations, I would have to die about 40 more times. And in order to save 0.5 seconds per death, I set my spawn point to the edge of the molten I go by lots of names pit. And then I proceeded to speed run dying 40 times. But of course, even when I am approaching my final moment, the game still found ways to be annoying. Because every time I died, the game gave me a paper memorial. This was the most useless duplication glitch of all time. And it appears I could not even have peace in the afterlife. and it appears that I could not even have peace in the next life. Because the game created a gravestone inside the smeltery, which broke the entire thing, since smelteries were supposed to be hollow, and were not capable of smelting graveyards. After accumulating 594 death lists, I got bored and started reading them. But then I noticed that the NBT data of these death lists were multiplying exponentially. 
This was because the most recent death list contained all the previous death lists, all the previous death lists contained all the previous death lists before that, leading to a combinatronic explosion, with only one outcome. A chunk ban. To avoid this, I stuffed all the inventory lists into the smeltery to dispose of them while still in the furnace, leading to me dying while surrounded by floating bloody paper. At long last, I now had 5 liters of blood, which were all casted into bloody meatballs to be used in the industrial revolution. Now this is where Baycock's foe actually becomes useful. While I was smelting clay into bricks and smelting 600 iron ore into 1.2 kilo iron ingots. I used all Baycock's foe, blood, obsidian, inver, osmium, and bricks, to create the coke oven bricks and blast furnace bricks. Next, I expanded base to make way for the industrial revolution, which concealed the scarred battlefield and approximately five of my old graves. There were also a few ancient pillars in the middle of the base now, which were incorporated into the overall aesthetic or something. This gave enough room for me to build three coke ovens, and a singular blast furnace. The next step was absolute torture. Because it involved the game mechanic known as waiting and staring at something. Putting coal into coke ovens would create coal coke, which took 50 seconds. With this time, I could have eaten a handful of almonds, eaten a handful of berries, or witnessed two violent crimes. But instead, I had to wait and do nothing. However, with three coke ovens, I obtained one coke per 17 seconds. And with one coke and one iron ingot, I could create one steel ingot in the blast furnace, every 60 seconds. The problem wasn't a lack of resources. I already had one kilo iron. The problem was the fact that this furnace was wasting huge amounts of time. But if I upgraded this and gave it electricity, this would be reduced to 20 seconds. So this became my immediate goal. Speedrunning getting the improved blast furnace. Using all methods necessary. And I mean all. Upon closer inspection. It appears that the production of coke has a byproduct of creosote oil. This was indeed what happened in reality according to BuzzFeed, which proved just how immersive immersive engineering was. And this wood shall be drilled by covering in creosote oil. This unfortunately did not cause them to fly when it was raining. However, I could create the engineer's workbench from treated wood, which was basically a fancier crafting table for making machine parts for the upcoming advanced machines. And as a reward for completing this quest, I got a staircase, and a seemingly useless chair wand. This chair wand could create invisible entities wherever I clicked. And I could sit on these. Of course, the original intention of this chair wand was to allow me to turn anything into a chair. But when I say I could turn anything into a chair, I meant it. The wand created the chair entities no matter where I right clicked. And this included making writable entities on walls instead of floors. I had invented the wall chair. It was at this moment that I decided to perform further experimentation with this chair wand. And I found that it had absolutely zero cool down. I could basically turn the chair wand into a ladder wand, by spamming right click on walls with it, causing me to basically ride my way up to the top of any challenging vertical climb. And this chair wand can be used to easily escape sticky situations, by creating an entity that I could teleport to. Further testing reveals that on flat surfaces, the wand was even more overpowered. By using a right click auto clicking application, I could travel rapidly by auto clicking placing chairs and sitting in chairs to create an infinite link of teleportation that sent me rapidly in one direction. This could be referred to as a divine journey. But that was later on. The problem was getting down. And I regret to conclude that the chair wand MLG was impossible. But further testing will be delayed until a few minutes later. I had gotten distracted from what I came here to do which was to compose the water wheel. This was simply made from a bit of steel and a lot of treated wood. But why make one wheel, when I could make three? Obviously these water wheels create electricity simply by rotating. And it rotates when you create a sideways waterfall, which is basically a river, on top of it. But these wheels must be connected to a kinetic dynamo to convert this rotation into electricity, using Faraday's law of induction or something. And this dynamo is assembled from an unusually high concentration of copper. 
I consumed a stack of copper, about one hammer, and a shear just so I could make one coil for the dynamo. This was because using these hand tools was extremely material and efficient. But by using the metal press, this will cut our federal spending in half. So the metal press will be the next machine I will create, which will be powered by the water wheel. But in order to transfer power, I will also need wire connectors, which were simply made from terracotta and even more steel. Now that I had everything to invent electricity, it was time to copy this tutorial from making the theoretical max efficiency water wheel set up, which involves covering 70% of the whole wheel in water. Contrary to popular belief, this will not cause the water wheel to fly, which is a good thing. But I had been betrayed. Because after copying this diagram into the real world, the water wheel did absolutely nothing. Therefore, it was not working. It was now time for the second most engaging game mechanic in immersive engineering, which was to randomly break stuff and randomly click stuff until the machine begins to work. This engaging game mechanic is present throughout approximately 50% of immersive engineering. This was truly immersive. As it turns out, the culprit of the May 2023 water wheel disaster, were these dirt blocks over here. Once I annihilated these, the wheel began to rotate, and the dynamo began to produce electricity. This was an epic win. Now it was time to make the metal press. This needed a few industrial machinations, including, engineering blocks. These were made of engineering parts, which needed blueprints, which needed paper. So it was now time for an epic conquest for sugar cane. I attempted to use the chair wand to rapidly traverse the world, but this did not go well. This was due to the existence of the arch nemesis of the infinite chair creator, which were known as trees. The wand would inevitably send me riding into a tree, causing me to suffocate, wasting 5 seconds of spamming the shift key to escape this wooden prison. So I decided to walk like a normal person. After creating the blueprints using lapis, paper, and some more steel, I used even more steel and osmium, as well as the blueprint, and this engineering table, to create a few steel and iron components. These, along with some metallic alloy constructs, pistons, and even more steel, would create the engineering blocks. Some notable mentions include conveyor belts and steel frames. Once all of these were created, I placed all of these blocks down in a specific arrangement to form what is known as a multi-block machine. Smashing this with a hammer results in the metal press being activated. Unfortunately, victory had not been achieved yet. The metal press needed molds to actually press things into shapes. So I used even more steel to create perhaps the usefulest mold in the history of molding and even more steel. Plate molds. After attaching this to the press, it was now time for the final part of the gaming plan. I shall use the wire connectors and some copper wire to connect the water wheel to the metal press, in order to power it. But then, nothing happened. Apparently, the power was not being transferred. It was now time for the third most engaging part of immersive engineering gameplay. Figuring out why the system won't work which could be 58,458 different reasons that were not talked about anywhere. After 5 minutes of doing random things, including breaking and replacing the water wheels, the system finally decided to work. And the metal press was now powered. I had now unlocked the ability to make plates from one ingot, instead of two ingots. This will make industrialization much cheaper. Now it was time to begin making massive amounts of iron plates, steel plates and copper plates. These would be crafted into external heaters, and would be combined with the blast furnace bricks to create the blast furnace bricks but even better. Now all of this would be combined together in the semi-cuboid structure, to create the new and improved upgraded blast furnace V2 MK3. By using some more copper wires and wire connectors, I used the power of the water wheel to power the external heaters to speed up the blast furnace. To make even more steel. Now, it theoretically took 20 seconds now instead of 60 seconds. But both were unbearably long. Based on this empirical evidence, I have come to the conclusion that there was no noticeable improvement. The only thing I could do now, was to make more of these to parallelize industrialization. 
but I did not feel like smelting myself 40 more times for more bricks. So what I shall do now, was place hoppers everywhere so I could automatically input coal and output coke and input iron in coke and output steel. Then I put in one kill a iron and kill a coal to make one kill a steel. This system could basically run forever. So I went to go do other stuff. It was now time to focus on the second questline starting with Baycock spoke. This was involved creating the aforementioned illegal herb farm. Which involves the infamous magic mod known as Roots. I had no idea why this was in the game, but it was necessary for industrial progress. And I was waiting for one kill a steel to initiate phase 2 of my industrialization. So it was time, to speed run the entirety of Roots to get all of the items I needed. Which were the scarab thingies and some other flowers. Stage 1 of Roots begins with collecting a bunch of nature themed items. But I had a head start since I already accumulated several species, phylum and genus of nature from my beginning explorations. So it was time for the real stage 1. Which was to turn these natural items into a bunch of random ritual altars, which could combine some more natural items to make advanced random items. Thankfully this did not need even more steel. After using Baycock's bow to murder this root, I smelted myself 10 more times for more blood meatballs for more bloodied stone. The murdered root was sprinkled on top of this to create the pyre. And on this pyre, I sacrificed some tree bark, stone, and moss, and burned everything, to create the charred stone. With this, it was now time to breed about 8 different flowers using a bunch of random objects. This would require exploration. So it was time to use the chair wand to speed run finding everything. On the mini map, I detected that there was a swamp somewhere northwest. So it was time to get to teleporting there. Before I knew it, I found myself in the great northwest swamp. And I was here to burglarize lily pads from the water. Now it was time to return to base to smelt the lily pads with some crushed flowers and sugar and other mineralogical constructs, to invent the Dugonia species. This was the predecessor to the Cloudberry, which needed blue orchids. So it was time to use this trail of invisible chairs to auto-click my way back there without losing much hunger. Since sitting in chairs did not burn calories. After collecting these orchids, I was now able to smelt these along with wool, grass and other natural constructs to construct the Cloudberry. But I only said I was able to craft it. And I will not actually perform the craft because making the cloud berry would consume the dugonia. Thankfully, I could grow infinite dugonia by using agriculture. Too bad these only grew on elemental soils because these were so-called magical flowers and blah blah blah. So it was time to put the flower conquest on hold. I went underground to subject myself to inhumane conditions to mine amethysts, garnet, and opal. I passed by several metric tons of iron ore. And it took several metric tons of restraint to not let the intrusive thoughts lead me towards the red circles and click on them. With all these gems, I was instructed by the quest line to make this magical wooden protrusion and this rather oddly shaped protrusion of stone, called a grove. This was needed to cast a spell that was super important. The grove supplication ritual. And this decade's biggest mystery was how to activate the so-called grove supplication ritual, because there is no information on this at all except from an obscure PNG that you click on in J. After absorbing this knowledge, I performed the ritual. And my grove was now slightly more yellow. This grove allowed me to do the third kind of ritual. The Fey ritual. Because apparently, communicating with the Great Lakes forest spirits in episode 1 wasn't enough. Now it was time to communicate with the magical fey spirits. And there is no actual lore behind this that I could find. So as far as I know, this was just a bunch of random rituals that I was being forced to do by some stranger named Nubanitis. Hopefully this will not have any real life consequences such as Hero Brian being summoned in real life. Anyways I had gotten distracted. I used more gemstones to create the fey crafter. These could convert dirt gravel, and some plant material into elemental soil. This was done by right clicking it with a knife to turn the Fey Crafter into Kansas Simulator. Which spits out whatever I needed. Now it was time to speed run turning the elemental soil into the four elemental soils. To get the air soil, 
I must climb high into the atmosphere using this abandoned staircase from the dark ages of making the arena for destroying Baycock. On top of this staircase, I threw the elemental soil high into the sky. And it changed into air soil. Now it was time for the opposite of air soil, which is earth soil. I went down into the great underground cave system of stone pickaxes. But while I was descending into the cave system, I obtained some random best-selling novel, about strange dreams. All it talked about were crystals, magic, and strange dreams. So I disregarded this information. I had important things to do. The water and fire soils were obtained simply from dipping stuff in dihydrogen monoxide and molten magma. And I shall place all the soils next to my ancient dead body because it would probably be more fertile or something. Then I planted all the flowers I had made so far. I then used bone meal to perform the well-known agricultural duplication glitch. And I invented the cloud berry. This cloud berry could be evolved into Pereschia by using more common plant materials. And Lilac. Wikipedia and the internet gave inconclusive information on where to find Lilac, so I wandered around in the forest until it came to me. And it came to me. But after the invention of Pereschia, this is where things get tricky, because now I needed to go to the nether. After doing a bit of spying on the quest, I made a shopping list of materials that I needed to steal. Now it was time to actually go into the nether. I had no plan on how I would get everything. So I shall simply survive and harvest stuff. As a small gift. I was given a fire resistance beverage by the book of quest lines. Which was its way of saying good luck. Because the nether turned out to be on crack. There were pestilential eggplants and serial killers on benzomethylagonine everywhere. So I shall avoid everything. But after getting two things I needed. I got distracted by the nether fortress right in front of me. Before I then got there. Everything went wrong because some CIA agent was trying to snipe me now. But with the magic of the chair wand, I teleported my way up the nether fortress. But then I no-clipped into the nether roof. As it turns out, the chair wand was so overpowered, that I could place chairs inside solid rock above me, and take a seat inside the solid rock. And if I spammed this repeatedly, I could basically teleport onto the ceiling of anything. But this footage came from the test world. I do not need to seek refuge on the nether route. So I stopped somewhere above and vain mined a small air pocket for myself. And I recovered from this incident. After reaching my full potential once again, I mined down onto the fortress below me. And this, is where I mined cobalt, hardite, blaze rods, and other stuff. The chair wand escorted me down the hallways of this fortress. And I eventually wandered back into the beautiful natural environment of the nether. But then, the game itself realized that I had become too overpowered with the chair wand and vein mining. So it threw several random mods at me. Including this random inventory expanding thing. And this random block rotation lock thing. Both of these kept blocking my screen, and I didn't know how to turn these off. But the industrialization, must continue. But then I realized, I was already done anyways. The last item I needed, magma cream was obtainable from non-natural methods. So this was an epic win. With everything I just found here, I created the Baffle Cap, Infernal Bowl, and Moon Glow Leaf. And I duplicated all of them using my massive stash of bone meal. Next, I would need some runic shears. These shears could apparently talk to ghosts or something. And this special ability will be used, to convert wheat and beetroots into weird fictional vegetables. The effects were vastly different when these shears were used to talk with animal spirits. Because the spirit of this cow would materialize special leather for me. For free. But then I was banned from talking to him after I apparently took too much stuff. Luckily I could simply beg from another cow spirit. After this exploitation of the working class, it was time for the final roots ritual of all time. The ritual, which was basically the final exam of magic involved turning this crop into a massive special tree. But as it turns out, this ritual was only a slight variation of all the other rituals. After completing this, I claimed my prize of slightly darker wood. 
and I finished the root speed run by using my new flowers, animal stuff, and wood, to create, this. The artificial scarab wings. Which is only useful in chapter 7. And yes, that was the entire point of the roots mod. Except for several spells that will probably be used approximately 3 times in the future. And even after all this, after returning to the so-called upgraded blast furnace, I was now only 25% of the way to getting 1 kilo steel. So it was time to trap myself in a dirt box, and afk the other 75% of the steel I needed for the project in the next episode. It is a top secret for now. But it shall aid me greatly in completing immersive engineering and evolving to achieve the next tiers of technology. Which involves mechanism, gaming computers, and other stuff. And then, when I become god itself, I will mow down the tens of other bosses that were coming pretty soon, in the next chapters. In conclusion, the invisible chair was overpowered. And I look forward to seeing what other overpowered objects the game would give me as I proceed towards unlocking the bag of truth. Like and subscribe and comment and smash the notification bell. And goodbye.